wherever you want to go. Even so, I did it. Going in the other one. Which one? Which other one? We all watch Paramount. Yes, sir. Which is the only one. 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 Which is the So we don't have so there's a guy from the ministry.
awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I'm Jimmy with the third back, yeah. I'll let our presenters know how to Good afternoon, everyone. We'll be starting in about a minute, so. Or any stuff there's not. And the, incin the incinerator one is up there, too. Well, I, I think they're all on here. It's all under control. <laughs> so good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, SUMA Convention 2019. Uh, I'll introduce myself. I'm Mike Strack, and I'm the Vice President of Villages. Resort Villages and Northern Communities for SUMA. I'm also the Mayor of Torquay, and I, I guess I'm the chairperson for this session. So before we get into the set into the session, we have to note the fire exits. Um, they're on page 25 of your handbook. So if, if you have that, I, I believe it's also on the app. So if you'd like to familiar, familiarize yourself with that information, um, you'll probably hear this lots this week about uh, this. So um, if you do it now, then you don't have to listen for that part of the, the sessions. So if you have questions for our presenters today, I'd, I'd, I'd ask that you come to the mic, identify yourself, your municipality, speak clearly into the mic as these sessions are going to be recorded and put on our YouTube channel um, further on in the, uh, in the month so that people that can attend or want to see the session again have that opportunity. So when we plan events for our members, we try to tailor the topics and speakers to your needs. The full bios for our presenters today are on the app. Um, so if you'd like to find out their bios, you can sure check that out on our app. I'd like to inform you that please give our speakers your full attention and be open to how their information can apply to your municipality. This session is sponsored by Pinter, and we have Peter Zerimiak here to uh, give a greeting. Peter? Hi, Mike, uh, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of Pinter, we are very proud to sponsor this event. We look at waste management, innovative ways, um, as an exciting opportunity. I think about four years ago, we were, we were at an, this event, and there was over 500 landfills. Now there's 300. I know myself, um, I came from the waste management industry. And it's always been a volume driven business where you had to have big numbers to be able to do these fancy, funky things that uh, people are talking about. I know that we're really interested today to hear 
all these innovative ideas. And I know from our perspective, we're an award-winning company, we're Saskatchewan-based, and we're here to help you guys out, but I'm really excited to hear you guys talk. So we're looking forward to presentations this afternoon. Thank you, Peter. So for our presenters today, I have to flip my page and find where you guys are. Our Mayor Rennie Harper, uh, Jason Chernenko, Greg Kuntz, and Mayor Sean Checkley. Um, Rennie, you ready? We'll start with you. I'm going to sit down on the front. Many of you wear uh, progressive lenses. This thing is about four feet from my eyes, so <laughs> we'll see how this works. So uh, good afternoon. Welcome to this particular session. My name is Rennie Harper. I'm the mayor of the town of Nippon. And um, what you'll see on my, on my lead slide is a very important word, and that word is partnership. Um, and the Boreal Area Regional Waste Authority, and we call it BARWA for short, is a partnership. It's a partnership to address responsible waste management. Hopefully this is going to look good, great. So I thought maybe I should start a little bit by um, some history. And um, about six years ago now, about 2013, it became very evident that there would be a change in the way waste was handled throughout our province. The provincial auditor's report had come out and it made recommendations for change and a new environmental code was born, so to speak. And at the time, at the time, Saskatchewan had about 700 odd landfills. We ranked higher at the time than California, who only had 278. Staggering number, 700. And uh, 505 of those were active, and about 200 were closed. And I don't know whether or not they were decommissioned. I don't know that part, um, but they were closed. And in 2013-14, there were 134 inspections across the province, and 73% of them found that the landfill sites were non-compliant. So that's kind of where we started, 2013, six, seven years ago. So I kind of thought maybe um, you might like to see what the slide looked like. This is, a, this is the slide at 2013. This is where, where the, the numbers came from. And you can see uh, that Alberta had 126 and Saskatchewan had 500. Uh, Manitoba had about 300. And, and you can see California that I just mentioned at 278 at the far right. Um, it has changed a little bit since then. The numbers are slightly different than they were at the time. Not hugely different. So again, a little bit more data because we need to put this all into, into a bit of perspective. And our motto as a group has always been, we can do better. And there are about 2,400 landfills in Canada. That's a statistic that I got from SWANA, uh, which means that there are one for approximately 14,000 people in Canada overall. Alberta has 98, which means there's one for every 48,000 people. Manitoba with 183, and they have different classes, which is different than Saskatchewan, has one for about 7,300 people. And then there's Saskatchewan. We have 198 permitted, which means that there's one for about 5,900 people in our province. So that's what the, the numbers look like across the country. And this slide is just a slide to show you um, that little red corner up in the, in the right-hand top. That's um, BARWA. Those are the partners of BARWA at the moment. Um, and if you look at this map a little bit more closely, it would tell you that there are at least four other landfill sites within a 100 kilometer radius of ours. Just an just a observation. So let's talk a little bit about BARWA and who we are and how we got started. I talked about 
about uh, 2013 and when things changed. But the Nip 1 landfill was constructed in about 1973. It's about, if you know uh, that part of the province, it's about six mil kilometers south of the town of Nipwon, uh, and it is surrounded by farmland. What we, we, we own a quarter section there, and the landfill utilizes about 19 hectares or 47 acres of that land, and 90 acres um, is still available for the future. Important thing to know. Uh, it was at the time initially owned by the co-owned by the town of Nippon, the RM of Nippon, and the village of Cadet, and the town of Nippon were the were the folks that operated it. Um, over that period of time, I lived about a quarter of a mile from the landfill, and let me tell you, there were lots of issues about burning, and uh, people were always upset about it. Um, the local hospital complained about the smoke inside the building and lots of lots of issues about burning. And leachate was found in the groundwater uh, sur surrounding our site. And we were told when um, the EPO came this one particular time, I could shut you down today. Not that he did. He helped us get going, but they could have. We weren't compliant. And due to the changes in regulations, a number of surrounding municipalities, because their landfills were full and they, they were running out of space, uh, began to haul to the Nippon site. So there was little or no um, gate management. Uh, it was open and people came and went. And I'm sure that you recognize that model. I think it happens even still today. And so. About 2004, the town of Nippon implemented a curbside collection for solid waste, recycling, and residential compost, and it kind of started to point them in a different direction. And so they eventually had a study, and, and they hired an engineering firm, which confirmed that Nippon waste disposal was impacting the groundwater. I talked about leachate, the groundwater ke chemistry, and it recommended that the site be environmentally monitored monitored before any expansion could be considered. So um, people started to pay attention and people, the, the people responsible sort of started to shake in their boots, if you will. And they told us then that a permit would uh, not expire per se, but improvements were required to meet regulations because we weren't doing that. And it was strongly suggested that recycling be offered to every affiliate member of the region. So work was done to implement uh, those kinds of things and lots of issues existed around the area. So. so we started to try to figure out what to do next. Eight municipalities, one First Nation, began to haul all of their waste to the landfill in addition to the three owners. So 11 municipal uh, organizations hauling, hauling to one landfill. And when the comment was made about the possibility of shutdown, and the need for compliance, the lights went on, and it was time for change. Like I said, a contractor was hired. Uh, they conducted a hydro hydrogeological study. Geotechnical work at the waste disposal site happened. MCDP was utilized, and you might wish to do this as well to assist in developing a potential business plan. Um, so there are resources out there, and we can certainly talk about that. Uh, if you want to stop me at any time, I can give you some information about how they did that. The study resulted in recommendations including the following. They suggested we needed environmental monitoring. We needed a mandatory recycling. We needed in to install line cells because we're in a very sandy part of the province. And we needed a leachate collection system. Missed one. So you're sitting around the table and you're trying to figure out, so how are we going to do that? How are we going to do all of that? And we, it took a while, but we recognized that we needed to do some work in partnership. Hence my very first comment. Partnership is a very important thing to foster. And uh, so we talked about the benefits of working together. It would lower the capital operating and maintenance costs for all affiliated members if we did that. Um, and like I said, waste diversion had expanded and it was including recycling. Um, and we were recycling things like 
uh, engine oil and filters and containers and grain bags and those kinds of things. And then as now, we wish there was a provincial directive to ensure the household sharps uh, that the diabetics across our country uh, dispose of in our landfill. We, we hope that there would be a way to be able to require them to be disposed in another way um, other than in our landfill. So we talked a lot about some of these things and realized that together we might make a difference. So initially the conversations began with those 11 municipalities that I talked about. Um, and you know very well that partnerships need lots of TLC. They're like bringing home the new baby. Um, you, you have to pay attention to them. And so the 11 kind of went to six, and I'm going to talk to you about that. And in 2015, 16, in a plan, we developed, uh, we got down to six partners and we developed a budget. Um, and we submitted that to the Minister of the Environment. And initially that plan considered a couple of things. We wondered if members only, as well as members and third party users is what we should do. Third party users would pay several times the amount that members paid. We didn't know if that's what we should do. We wondered about whether or not we should become a transfer station. Um, it looked like a possible option, and we did lots of homework about how much would that cost, what would that mean, um, what would that mean as far as hauling and the impact on, on our roads surrounding and all of those kinds of things. And ultimately, we decided that building a new landfill was what we thought that we should do. So in from 2013 to 2018, so five, six years, Farwell becomes a regional reality. And these are the partners, the town of Nippon, the RM of Nippon, the village of Kadat, the village of Ailsham, the resort village of Tobin Lake, the RM of Connaught. And we started operating Barwa on April 1st of last year, 2018. So we have a few months under our belt, not a year yet. Uh, so we're pretty green and we're learning a lot of things, as will you if you proceed. So we ended up having to sign agreements and we needed lots of legal advice. So a uh, significant cost with that and some negotiating and, and each time you're taking it back to six various councils for a review and so on and so forth. Um, but ultimately we, we did that. Service agreement began um, our operations. We made a service agreement with the town of Nippon to operate until we're ready. And there's a strong desire on the part of the partners they, they really do want to operate entirely on their own. They want, do not want to use a service agreement, but we recognize that we needed to start with that. So we have a service agreement in place until December 31st of this particular year. And then it's our intention um, to hire our own staff and, and run the landfill ourselves. So the next thing then was to transfer the permit and, and to get buy-in from the department and, and get all of that done. And then we recognized that all of us were volunteers. We're all, all six of us have a representative from our various councils, and we are the directors of BARWA. Um, as you can imagine, starting a new company um, takes a huge amount of time. So we recognized early on that we needed to hire a general manager. So that's our one employee to date. We do have a general manager, uh, and he came uh, just right at, the, at April 1st. We recognized that loans were required because, of course, we needed equipment. We've, we thought that we'd like needed to go from um, volume to weight. So to do that, we needed a scale, which we don't have. Um, we found that our permit requires that the entire site needs to be fenced. Um, the willows that were planted at one time for fencing were no longer um, adequate, and so we rec required fencing. So. Um, it wasn't very long before we recognized that we needed to take out a loan, not just a loan for purchasing the land, which is what we had, about um, one and a half million dollars. And then we needed to figure out how were we going to buy the scale and how were we going to do the fencing. And we needed some equipment. How were we going to have a loader and those kinds of things. So very quickly you become um, involved in the reality of running this new business. 
and it didn't take us long before we figured out that we probably eventually were going to need a new building as well. But we're not there. I just I, I stuck this slide in here because I just wanted you to see whoever said that landfills aren't beautiful. <laughs> I uh, this was taken uh, not that long ago on a day when the, the everything was covered with hoarfrost and and it's actually a very beautiful picture and it is the smoothest sledding you'll ever get. So th this is a picture of the gate of our landfill. This was kind of in the fall. And, and so we, again, we needed new fencing. We needed a gate because we needed to, to monitor. We needed to have signage. Um, this, is, this is a picture of, of the, the old landfill is in the farthest top right-hand corner. And you can just see uh, the corner of our new line cell in the corner, we hadn't started using it at this point, but that's where the cell is in relation to the to the rest, kind of. And this is what they call leachate pond, um, just so you can see what that looks like. Just going to move on here. So. I sort of titled the, this slide, Let the Next Stage Begin, but to meet future needs and work to ensure regulatory requirements, some Saskatchewan municipalities like ours are forming regional waste management partnerships. And I'm here to tell you that you can do that too. It does take some, like I said, TLC, but partnerships is a good way to move forward. Um, the responsibilities are delegated to a legally formed authority, which operates one central facility. And we've begun to charge at the gate, which takes a lot of education. Uh, BARWA is a legal entity at this point. It's a para, what we call a paramunicipal organization. And it's governed by a board comprised of six voting representatives from each of the six uh, member councils. BAR was funded by all of the participating municip municipalities and takes on all aspects of waste management, including recycling and waste education. Well, waste education, I'm just going to stop there for a minute, is something we're hoping very much will become a responsibility that will be overseen by the province. Um, we'll see how that works. Um, currently, Barwa uses a service agreement, like I said, to have the staff of the town of Nippon op operate the site, and that'll happen until January 1st of 2020, um, and we hope by that time we'll be ready. So I'm here to tell you this isn't necessarily an easy gig. Like I said, it already took six, seven years. There are lots of challenges. Cash flow happens to be one of them. Um, employee recruitment. Um, in our case, we're going to be transferring possibility of, we have a unionized work environment, so we're thinking about how that will work. Um, more piezometer testing further from the site, so there was a, is, will be a requirement to negotiate with farmers that farm around us because the piezometers are going to be some distance away. Um, we recognize that there is the opportunity to expand partnerships. Like I said, we're in one kind of one in in a corner of the province. Um, there are five landfills within a hundred hundred kilometer radius. Seems a bit odd. Um, sharps continue to be a res, uh, um, an issue, and um, there is a, a provincial process I think that's needed to address that. We need to find some viable alternative revenue streams, uh, which we are also working with the province to do, and. Technology is ever changing, and I, no I noticed just recently, and I don't know if any of you have noticed, but there is um, a, a grant called the Mo Innovation Fund, I think, uh, that people can apply for or, um, to get a. It's a nominal amount of money, but it's an opportunity to see how technology can work with landfills, and we are thinking about applying for that or have. Um, and then a new company needs new equipment. Needs equipment. Uh, you don't really realize it when somebody else is operating it, but it does. It becomes evident pretty soon that you need to uh, buy some things, and you you need to continually stay compliant. And things are ever changing. Um, like I said, we already know that we have to add more piezometers surrounding our areas. Farmers may not want to negotiate about that. I don't doubt for mi one minute that that's not going to be such an easy task. Changes in councils. Um, we change every four years. Um, so I was not involved with the initial beginning of BARWA, 
Um, but during my term, we've become an operating company. What will happen when the next council comes? Uh, there's relearning that happens. So that, that's a huge challenge. Uh, ensuring constant and consistent communication with member councils is a big deal. We've, we've finally kind of figured out um, that we share our minutes and so on and so forth, and it's a regular standing item on our, our council agendas uh, to talk about Barwa so that each, each member knows what's happening. There are engineering costs. Every phase requires engineering, and the costs can be astronomical. You all know that and you can't do without it. Tra trained landfill operators, um, I'm not sure that there's a program to do that at this point in time. And the need for consistent provincial standards uh, is also, and guidelines is also a very big deal. It's a challenge for us. We need to develop policies. So <laughs> where we assumed before that there were safety policies in place and, and all of those kinds of things, we quickly realized that we needed our own confidentiality policies and our own st safety training policies, and uh, we needed to be um, become a member of. Uh, we needed to have a payroll system and all of those kinds of things. So those are things that you're starting to think about. And I wish that we had started a little bit before. Yeah, we're operating and now we're doing. So um, when you when some of you are doing that, um, hopefully you'll maybe give us a call and and uh, we can put some bugs in your ear. There's a huge amount of time spent researching opportunities for vi viable recycling. Um, we spend a lot of time doing it. There's not a one-stop shop. There's not a website that you can actually go to where a lot of these resources are. You're always looking for, to see what kind of opportunities are there. And Saskatchewan's a small province, and it would be helpful if those kinds of things were amalgamated somewhere. And uh, it's one of the things that we've been talking about as well. So what's the future? Changes required uh, provincially if we're going to reduce our landfill footprint in this province, I think. And uh, I have a particular um, interest in, in landfills. And we actually stopped calling, or I've been calling it that, but we started to call it a waste diversion. What we try to do the most is focus on reuse, repurpose, and recycle, and put as little into the whole as we possibly can. And uh, so we call it waste diversion. And some of the other speakers that are here are going to talk about that a little bit more. I'm just sort of setting the stage. Um, so more partners perhaps are in our future. I think that's uh, we're very hopeful about that. Um, I, I do have a question about why the goal in our province is to decrease the number of landfills. Uh, are there more sites, um, as more sites are sort of ready to be decommissioned and the landfills are full, um, it would be good if we sort of did some thinking about how we proceed before we issue new permits and so on and so forth. And um, as it happens, some months ago, I was appointed to a provincial um, solid Waste Advisory Committee um, making recommendations, getting input and making recommendations to the Ministry of the Environment. Um, so we've heard from across the province from a lot of you and a lot of your ideas and a lot of your recommendations will be presented um, sort of at the beginning of March, beginning of April uh, to the Ministry of Health. So um, if you want to talk about any of that, I'd be happy to take your, your feedback there as well. And the final thing here in the future, education is critical. It's not just important for me to, for me and those of you that are on councils to know about recycling and how much waste we generate and that we have 700 landfills in our province, <laughs> one, one for 6,000 of us. And uh, so education is critical. And I think education, we're hoping that education uh, will, will be sort of led provincially and that we'll each have a part in that, but that there will be an overarching model for education. It's critical if we're going to reduce our footprint and change what we do today. So um, this is my hopeful slide. In the middle of every, every opportunity or every difficulty lies an opportunity. Uh, and I think that's absolutely true. 
the opportunity here is to work in partnership, to learn from others like those sitting at the table and those of you that are out there and have experience. That's the opportunity. And that's the opportunity that SUMA has afforded us today. So um, I hope you'll, you'll take us up on that. And I'm here to encourage you to do it too. I think some of you have, have probably thought about, could, can this work? Will this work for our part? I encourage you that you can do this too. Um, it's an investment. It takes time. It takes a lot of your energy, um, but partnerships, I think, are the way of the future. Uh, and with, with that, I would invite anybody that wants to to give us a shout. Um, we'll help you in whichever way we can with what experience we've learned to date. Thank you very much. Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jason Trenaco. I'm the CAO from the town of Winyard, and I'm here to talk about recycling along with uh, landfills. And I'm going to have to use my own timer because this clock is way off. According to this, it's only 20 after 10. Anyway, I thought I'd start with a little bit of levity, uh, compliments of uh, comedian John Doerr. Uh, just a question to think about. Have you ever tried to uh, put a garbage can into the garbage? It never gets picked up. <laughs> For whatever reason, garbage men will not pick up garbage cans, even if they're all beaten up and old. So anyway, oh, I should have said, hello, is this thing on? <laughs> Anyway, when discussing solid waste uh, management, one cannot have a conversation regarding landfills without an equally serious conversation regarding, recyc or regarding recycling. These two topics are very closely related. So in the town of Winyard, I'll give you a little bit of history. The town of Winyard has been involved with recycling in one form or another since uh, 1991. I look back in our history book and uh, June 1st, 1991 was the official opening of the Winyard Recycle Center. And that was a result of a dedicated group of local citizens who formed the Winyard Environmental Club. The first recycling center was housed in an old building which used to be a tire shop and that building is no longer around. So the type of uh, recycling material accepted was limited. However, town engineer Mike Solihob implemented a parallel recycle program in which blue bins were set up at various locations in the downtown district to collect cardboard and paper. So this parallel program was run out of the old town shop where the items were bailed and shipped to end users. I guess I'm like you, Mayor Rennie, I, or yeah, I keep forgetting to... Uh, Keep forgetting to hit the hit the the uh, screen here. So upon seeing a need to have recycling processed out of uh, one location, the town decided it was time to upgrade building. So in 1995, the town purchased a building which used to house a machine shop. So uh, you talk about recycling. The original structure was constructed in 1935, with an addition added in 1955. And although old, the building served its purpose for well over 20 years. And there's our beautiful old recycle building. So the small part is the 1935 part, and the bigger part is the, uh, the 1955 edition. And the one thing you don't see there is to the right is our used oil eco center. So prior to the town implementing a recycling program, in 1988, Sarcan had set up operations in Winyard. So Sarcan operations, they were run out of various buildings and it's mostly privately owned for a number of years. 
but the constant moving of operations was not sustainable. So Sarcan moved into the town's recycling center when we purchased the uh, previous pictured building in 1995. So Sarcan operated from the recycle center for over 10 years. However, due to the age and condition of the building, along with the difficulty in loading their trailers, Sarcan approached the town in 2005 with a request to find another facility for them. So in 2006, the town purchased the building in which Sarcan would operate. So this upgraded building uh, is one where the original structure was constructed in 1936 instead of 1935 with a cinder block addition which was added in 1979. So uh, Sarcan remodeled the building and added a scissor lift for loading trailers. And there is that building which is still standing but it's soon to be uh, going under the wrecking ball. So again, as with the town's uh, building, this building served its purpose for well over 10 years. However, as the number of items Sarcan would accept increased, the limitations of the building surface. And in 2014, Sarcan again approached the town regarding the need for a newer modern facility. So it was also around this time that the Ministry of Environment started issuing press releases regarding future changes to landfill regulations. And Mayor uh, Rennie uh, commented on that quite well. So although the implementation of the landfill regulations was supposed to be smooth and occur over a five-year period, and uh, a lot of us in this room know that that did not occur, Wynyard's Town Council saw the writing on the wall and decided that one of our Building Canada Fund applications should be for a comprehensive recycle centre which would satisfy the needs of both the town and Sarkan. And it's worth noting that Sarkan was heavily involved in the design of the building. And, and overall, uh, Sarkan, I would say, has been a very good partner in, in recycling in, in the town of Winyard, and I'm sure across the province. So although the town of Winyard had run a recycle program for years and diverted hundreds of tons of items from the landfill, for whatever reason, we did not recycle everything and most notably uh, plastic. And that was always something that stuck in, stuck in my craw for a lot of years when I was hired at the town. I couldn't understand why we didn't uh, uh, recycle plastic, but a lot of it had to do with uh, room and uh, resources and availability of you know, space was a big thing. So the belief uh, was that an expanded recycling facility would give us the space and equipment to expand our recycling program to include plastics. So when we sent in our two applications to the recently announced BCF program, Building Canada Fund, and when I say recently announced, I'm talking about the previous intake, because as a lot of us know in here too, we're all anxiously waiting for the next uh, BCF uh, intake to be announced. Uh, the Recycle Centre proposal was actually our second choice. Our first choice was to replace our approximately 7,000 feet of cast iron water mains, which we still have in our distribution system. And I, I think I'll uh, go off script here a little bit. I'll just tell you a little bit about my uh, the application for the Recycle Centre. Um, I can't believe it was accepted. Uh, it was a throw-in application and about a day or two before the uh, deadline to to submit it i was getting a text from our engineer who was on a beach in hawaii giving me uh, square footage numbers to use for the cost uh, estimates and i hand drew uh, my vision of the town's portion of the recycle building onto sarcans and that was the plans that i submitted and that was the one that got accepted so Never know, you can just uh, keep sending those applications in and you never know what's going to get accepted and what isn't. But anyway, the Building Canada Fund Committee decided that solid waste management was a priority and approved the Recycling Centre grant and therefore Council decided to proceed with the project. So after we got past the point of no return, the Ministry of Environment uh, drew a line in the sand and our Environmental Protection Officer closed down our landfill and turned it into a transfer station. 
And again, I have here, where did the five-year implementation period go? Because uh, that there sure is no five years, that's guaranteed. So with costs surpassing 500,000 for phase one of constructing a new landfill, council saw the opportunity of diverting, or the, sorry, the importance of diverting all possible materials from the landfill. So the actual cost of the landfill, taking into account the assessments and other studies, engineering fees and so forth, was closer to the $600,000 range. So um, listening to Mayor Rennie, uh, you know, we did look at joining one of the three regional landfills within 70 to 100 kilometers from Winyard. However, when the numbers were crunched, it made fiscal sense to continue with the construction of our own regulation compliant landfill. And I remember I brought this up with uh, Sarah Keith, who's the head EPO officer in the province. And she said to me, well, there must be something wrong because there's no way it should cost you more to join a regional landfill than it does to construct your own. And when I say cost more to join, I don't mean it was going to cost us 600000 to join, but it was going to cost us 320000 to join the closest one, plus fifty two to 55000 per year in membership fees. So when you take that over a five or 10 year period, um, to have the convenience of your own landfill uh, definitely outweighed joining one of the regional ones. And as much as we wanted to join one of the regional ones, it just didn't make sense. But I shouldn't say it didn't make sense. It didn't make fiscal sense. So with the decision made to proceed with the joint funding construction of a $1.2 million recycle center and to proceed with the construction of a $600,000 landfill, the next issue with which council needed to grapple is how do we get the citizens to recycle as much as possible and divert as much waste as possible from the landfill? And the simple answer is that one must make it as easy as possible for people to recycle and divert that waste from the landfill. So with the decision to proceed with the joint funding construction of the Comprehensive Recycling Centre, Council also made the decision to implement single stream residential curbside recycling through a third party. So even though the Recycle Centre is not being used as originally planned, and by that I mean the plan to collect and sort and bale our own, uh, our own plastics along with all the other things that we were recycling, um, the Sarkan uh, part of the facility is busier than ever and the, down, and the town continues to collect, bail and ship a tremendous amount of commercial, industrial and institutional cardboard and paper. But I think it's also worth noting right now that another issue with the recycling is, so at the time after we had started to, uh, uh, or after we'd made the decision to proceed with this recycle center, and everyone, uh, especially the councillors here, uh, you got to realize how difficult it would be to turn down three quarters of a million dollars from uh, higher levels of government. So that's what we were approved for. So we were, uh, we needed to build for Sarkan regardless of what happened with the town side of it. But um, the the town side is still very busy. But um, the plastics created an, an issue for the town too because when we tried to find our own end market user all of a sudden that's when uh, things changed in china and uh, people weren't take the, these companies that that uh, we previously had planned to take our uh, our plastics to all of a sudden said well we're only taking number two or number seven i forget which was the the high priority ones, but if you went with someone who had a contract already with a recycling system, you could still send all your plastic there. So that's to, I took that picture just uh, about a week and a half ago, and that's after we would have shipped a big load out sometime in December. So that's not very long. So what is there? There's 18 bales of cardboard there. And the other two are 
office uh, office waste, uh, office mix, magazines, other things. So it doesn't take very long. You can imagine all that going loose in your landfill. So that really shows the importance of recycling. That's the Sarcan side, and I, I think that was taken on a Monday. So I was actually surprised. I was hoping that uh, that whole room would be filled with uh, recyclables like it usually is, but that was on a Monday, so they probably had everything loaded up into the truck already. Uh, but that's just the, uh, they got the can crushing machine there, and uh, they have a, a night drop off, I believe, on there. And that's uh, milk cartons, I believe, on the on the right. But Sarcan is is very busy. It's a rare occurrence when I drive by there that there's not vehicles out there. And this is going to be uh, this is related to Mayor Rennie's uh, presentation. Um, so one bone of contention experienced with the town of Winyard. Uh, besides the lack of the promised five-year implementation period for compliance, uh, is the lack of buy-in from neighboring municipalities. And I'm talking about RMs. Uh, we have three neighboring municipalities that, that really, that, that the Quill Lakes don't affect. Uh, that would be, you would consider Winyard their, their home center. And so out of those three, the council extended an olive branch to the three neighboring RMs to participate in our recycling program and, and our waste management program as well. One was interested, one was on the fence, but decided to go on their own. And one was an outright rejection, because as they like to tell us, it's not their responsibility. So it is fairly difficult to have regional cooperation without the cooperation part. And I know we've gone to them numerous times to our neighboring RM, who also control the hamlets and that, uh, uh, the other urban centers around there. And like when you just have that attitude where that's your, that's urban responsibility, that's not our responsibility, it makes it really difficult. So I'm always very, I'm not going to say jealous, I'm always very envious when I hear things about uh, places like the town of Nipawin that that get uh, six municipalities to cooperate. And I remember being at a SUMA Central Regional meeting probably 10 years ago, and I can't remember, it's either Kyle or Kipling. And they have a very good relationship with, uh, with their neighboring RMs. They have uh, uh, equal cost sharing of their, not only their sports, their recreation facilities, but also their uh, landfill. But there is a happy ending, in my opinion. The town of Winyard now has a fully compliant and much appreciated landfill, complemented by an extremely well-used comprehensive recycling center, which includes the town's own recycling program, SARCAN, and the SARC used oil center, eco center. The town of Winyard's waste management program is something which instills pride in our citizens and is the shining example of something which gives the town a hometown advantage. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I have to look back here because I had something else, and, but I lost my train of thought with that cough. Um, anyway, if I think about it, I'll come back to it. So there's our new recycle center. That's, uh, doesn't look like it, but that's $1.2 million uh, sitting right there and 700 and some thousand uh, contributed by the province. So th this one includes the loading dock, the Sarcan, and then the town, uh, the town side. And that's just a closer look at the, the Sarcan entrance and the town entrance. And that's my presentation.
All right. I too will I watch down to make sure I don't run too long. I can talk about all things landfill for an eternity. So I think we we kind of stage these presentations in this order for a reason. Um, you know, to get to how do you get compliant landfill? How do you get the recycling in place? What and then what happens once you have all that in place? There's other things that creep up and there's other things that will come. And City of Regina, we've got, I would say, a pretty big landfill. So we're going to share with you some of the other problems, uh, which turned out to be opportunities, I guess, for us in the long run. So my name is Greg Kuntz. I'm a manager with City of Regina in the Environmental Services Branch. Um, I'm an engineer. Um, I'm sorry. I deal with all things waste in the city of Regina, whether it be garbage, whether it be sewage. I'm not allowed to talk about work at the kitchen table, but I find it fascinating and it's really interesting how you can tell so much about a community and, and people in the community by the waste they produce. So there's our landfill. This was during our recent uh, expansion phase a couple of years ago taken from a hot air balloon, if you can believe it, by an engineer who was working on the project at the time. I put it up there just to give you a bit of a sense of scale. Um, Regina's got the biggest landfill in the province. As it stands right now, based on statistical analysis from, from some benchmarking initiatives, we take in anywhere between 20 and 25% of all municipal waste in the province. Our landfill currently holds somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 million cubic meters of material, whether that be dirt or garbage. Um, it was first built in 1961. You can see in the north section here. Since then, we've done quite a few expansions, and all the new expansions are fully lined, fully compliant, and all all those things. But uh, the sheer scale of it, we bring in 200,000 tons of MSW every year. Um, a lot of that is organic material, probably in the 30 to 50 percent range, based on a lot of the things we do. So when that stuff hits our landfill, we get a lot of rotting garbage in our landfill, and that leads to a lot of problems for us. So we get gas generation in our landfill. Because it's such a big landfill, oxygen can't get inside of the hill. We get a lot of rotting garbage. Um, we've got a pretty dry landfill compared to most in the country. Us in Saskatoon are actually quite similar, I would say. So we get less aggressive methane production, but it's produced over a very long period of time, and it definitely does cause issues for us. But what that does for us, it gives us a very predictable gas being formed. So gas collection, this is one of the more common questions I get is how, how do you get gas out of, out of a landfill? Essentially, like we were talking about piezometers earlier, you drill piezometers into the landfill, except you're not looking for water, you're looking for gas. So we've got 27 vertical collection wells in there right now. All of them are an individual headers, or, or sorry, have individual headers themselves, which are connected to a large header system with main, two main branches on it. Everything in that system is plastic, HDP, PVC, or stainless steel. Um, this is due to the highly corrosive nature of the materials we're bringing out of the landfill. So we need to be very careful about the engineering that goes into these things and how they're installed. Uh, also, the entire system is below the surface of the landfill to prevent freezing. As you pull landfill gas out of a system, a lot of liquid is entrained in it. And I'll get to how we get some of that out. But if you don't, you get a lot of freezing issues. And that's something that, you know, Saskatoon and ourselves have been working a lot on, talking back and forth about how do we stop that from happening. Um, in the old system, we had a flare, which I'll get to the systems here in a minute. But essentially, we sucked on the hill in a very gentle way. Uh, at about 300 cubic feet per minute, and it pulls that gas out of the hill in a very calm, controlled way so that we don't have breakthrough in certain areas or, you know, have atmospheric breakthrough in some areas. So we want to make sure we're getting good gas. So sufficient gas for 50 years of collection. So that's a bit of a quick overview of the gas collection system. So I was talking about those wells. We have 27 of these wells in there. You can see the installation method on the side. They're drilled down 15 meters down into the landfill itself. So that's another indication of how big the landfill is that we could drill 15 meters into it. We don't even get halfway through it. So we drill into it. It's perforated pipe, which means it's just got a whole bunch of holes in it so that gas can enter. 
that's an example of our brand new header systems we installed. They're really, really nice because we can control the flow out of every well on that hill and control everything we see coming out. So we can have a very controlled access to the gas, which is our fuel for our landfill gas system. So the flare, I talked about, we've got a landfill gas to energy, uh, to energy system, but before that, there was the flare we all talked about. It was installed in about 2007. Back then, it wasn't regulated. Um, nowadays, gas and, and landfills and stuff has a lot more regulated, built into our permit to operate. Back then, it wasn't regulated. This was a voluntary action by the city of Regina to reduce smell, reduce explosion risk, and probably not as much of a driver then, but now to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the landfill. By taking this stuff, this methane, out of the hill and burning it, we reduce the greenhouse gas footprint by about 30,000 tons a year. Now, people ask, how can you do that by burning something? Methane is a uh, greenhouse gas, which is approximately 23 times more harmful as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So simply by reducing it and burning it from a methane to a carbon dioxide form, we have that effect and that reduction, which is excellent. But then we said, why, why are we burning this? We've got all this energy coming out of this landfill. Uh, Saskatoon has a similar system, not the same system, but a similar system. So we said, well, why the heck are we doing this? We've got this energy source sitting there that surely we can use for something. So we built a landfill gas energy system. So what the system is, I warned you, I'm an engineer. So the nerd in me says it's a reciprocating lean burn engine that burns landfill gas created by anaerobic degradation of organics in the landfill. So what's that mean? Essentially, organics rot in the absence of oxygen. They form methane. Methane is fuel for our engine. What the system is not, uh, a lot of times I talk to people and they say, wow, that's a, that's a really impressive waste energy system you've got there. It's not a waste energy system. A waste energy system is something similar we're going to see later with some extra wingdings and add-ons where you actually burn the waste or you gasify the waste itself. This is simply using something, a byproduct, like the leachate you see is a byproduct. Well, this is gas that comes off the landfill. It's a byproduct. It's a harmful byproduct to the environment. We capture it and we use it for good purposes. So it's a source of electricity now because of this engine. And everything that we produce, we sell through SAS power. So there it is. I talked about talked about it. I wanted to build up the suspense. Um, the second day I worked for the city of Regina, my director came to me and said, guess what? You're going to build a landfill gas to energy system. I said, I, I know nothing about electricity. She said, suck it up. Go do it. So this is what we ended up building. Um, the process is really quite interesting. On this end, we have a landfill that has rotting material in it, forming all this gas that would otherwise escape into the atmosphere. We capture that material or that gas, and we bring it in through condensate knockout tanks. That removes water from the uh, gas. It's entrained in the gas. It's very wet gas. We run it through some chillers, which further knock out the liquids in the gas, and then we send it to our engine. Our engine is a big engine, which we'll talk about. It turns a generator. The generator sends electricity to some switch gear, which we in turn send to SAS power. Diane, everybody laughs about Diane, because Diane is always telling our engineers what to do, always telling our technologists what to do. They're always like, oh, Diane. And Diane can actually phone them and tell them when something's wrong. So when you hear in the office, oh, Diane, just shut up, Diane. They're, they're not talking about a person. Luckily, we don't have anyone named Diane in our office, so who can take offense to it. They're talking about the dialogue network. It's the brains of the operation. It's an incredibly smart system. It controls and monitors every aspect of our engine and the blowers and the conditioning units. Conditioning units, that's the gas knock that I'm talking about. The blowers, they ramp up, ramp down. They control all the gas entering that system. What it does is it ensures that our gas is usable. Um, if we get not enough gas, we get too much gas. Just like every car engine, you're going to see it'll stall or you'll flood it. Um, believe it or not, you can flood a gas engine like that. So the gas conditioning system. As I said, the, the gas that comes out of the landfill is extremely wet. Uh, the wet, the, the liquid component of it is actually extremely corrosive to the engine as well, and it's just not very nice stuff at all. The last sample we took of it, it had a pH of like two or something like that. And so we don't want anything like that running through our engine. 
So the gas conditioning building itself, it was built in Quebec by a company called Gas Drive, and they're our service provider for this engine. Um, there's chillers. It takes it down to about six degrees Celsius, and when you take gases down to a temperature like that, it just knocks all the liquid right out of it. Uh, knocks it into a tank, which we then pump out, and then we dispose of appropriately. The four blowers I talked about, we don't actually need four blowers on this system. We've actually built it with redundancy built in because there is enough gas being produced in that hill at any given time to run at least two engines. So we've got four blowers built in there right now. Uh, we do have an application into SAS power for possibly constructing a second engine and expanding our well fields. And we have an application into the low carbon economy fund for a full gas well expansion. Now, you might ask, well, what's that all cost you? Well, the engine itself is probably a price tag of two to three million dollars. The gas well expansion is likely a price tag of three point two million dollars by our estimates. So these are not small investments we're making. However, they pay off in the end from our greenhouse gas footprint uh, reduction. Also, I'll get to later on just what we as a city are seeing as as a positive spin-off benefit from this. It was something that has always been a huge issue for us that we've really turned into something that uh, is a benefit to us and has been very well received by, by the community and the regulators as a whole. I'm behind on my pages up here. Up, up, up. So the gas analyzer, as I said, we pull the gas out. Now, methane and gas, it's not just methane that comes out of that landfill. It's methane, it's carbon dioxide, there's a little bit of oxygen mixed in, and then there's a whole bunch of really nasty stuff. But luckily, that really nasty stuff is only about a half a percent of what comes out of there. It's almost a 50-50 split between carbon dioxide and methane, but it does vary with time. So we've got this gas meter that monitors on a continuous basis, uh, many times a second, what the gas looks like coming into the system. What it actually does is controls the throttles and gas mixers in, in the engine. So uh, we don't set how the uh, gas feeds in. Diane, which I talked about earlier, that smart computer, it monitors multiple times a second and adjusts all the inputs into the engine. So they can run off this byproduct that is not very nice stuff. To be honest, the first time I smelled it, I almost threw up all over my shoes. Um, but it controls how that enters the system. The engine itself. So the engine itself is, it's just a big engine. Think about a tractor engine, any tractor engine you've seen, except it doesn't run off diesel fuel. It runs off of methane gas. 20 cylinder gas burning engine. It's just shy of 50 liters of displacement. Uh, one of the most impressive, and, and everybody is shocked by, by this fact, is it holds 600 liters of oil at any given time. Oil changes on this thing are not a simple task. Um, there are pumps and tanks dedicated to oil changes for this thing. So it's not as simple as drop, uh, having a plug and dropping it in a pan. It's 600 liters out, 600 liters back in. System itself weighs in the neighborhood of 14,000 kilograms. So it's a big unit. Uh, the real interesting thing about this, and, and this is one of the large differences between Saskatoon's system and ours. Saskatoon is a caterpillar system, which is a North American system. And it was built on site and built for their site. This is a general electric system. It's a Jambacher. It was built in Austria. It was built across the ocean. They built it in the sea can. They put it on a boat and they shipped it over to us, and we dropped it in place and put a few extra pieces on it, and away it went. These are what they like to call plug-and-play systems, so they're not purpose-built, but they're built so that any landfill can be set up on one, and then you just set the computer to adjust and run it, however. The generator, or as we call it, the money maker. Without this, all it does is burns gas. The engine will burn gas, it'll turn a shaft, and you'll get no productive use out of it. You put a generator like this on the end, and we get one megawatt of electricity generated by this thing at any given time. And then the electrical part. Um, I'm not an electrical engineer. I'm not an electrician. So you'll just have to take my word for this stuff because I got it from people who were. It's rated to produce 1,058 kilowatts of electricity just over one megawatt. We always ramp it a little bit over. We get paid for one megawatt by SAS Power, but we always ramp it up just a bit past because they can take it, but if we give them less, they'll pay us less. So we always want to make sure we're giving them just a little bit more, and it doesn't cost us any more to do so. So just to put this into perspective, though, 
at the time I built this presentation was probably a year or two ago. SAS powered a peak generation rate of 3,600 megawatts. So we're just one megawatt in that whole system. So while it seems big when you're out there and looking at it, it it's a drop in the bucket really of the whole thing, but it, it has a you know really great effect for the city. Oh, did I skip over one? Sorry. Let me see. No, never mind. I was out of order. So the really interesting thing about this one too, it was unlike any project the city had ever completed. Um, the city of Regina is not in the power generation business by any stretch of the imagination until two years ago. Now we are. Um, we needed engineers. The contracts on this thing were huge. You could fill that desk with the contracts that we had to just to buy the engine and to enter into the agreements with SAS Power. Uh, we needed all kinds of trades, everyone you can imagine, service techs, utility billing within the city of Regina. We had to tie it into our own billing systems and then coordinate that with SAS Power's billing system. So there was a lot of back and forth there. Finance, of course, SAS Power, they've been a great partner on this. Um, I think SAS Power gets a bad name sometimes and, and people kind of like to rip on them, but throughout this whole project, SAS Power was fantastic to deal with. They're an excellent partner and as we operate with them, um, we're having nothing but a great relationship with them. So the numbers, so as I said, there's a lot of benefits to this thing for the city of Regina. We took a waste product that could potentially form hazardous atmospheres within our work sites, possibly cause explosions on our work sites, was causing damage to the environment through greenhouse gas emissions. So we run this thing about 80% of the time. Um, that's just because it has downtime. Um, oil changes, they can't be running. We have to do overhauls on it, things like that. But over a 20 year contract we've got with SAS Power, when you average it out, we we make about a million dollars a year of revenue off this thing, which is great. It's money that we can put back into our landfill operations or even put into other community uh, things that we do and it's essentially free money we found so for a five million dollar investment we're going to make 20 million dollars over the life of this thing uh interestingness uh, interesting is after sixty thousand hours though we have to do a full rebuild on it it just it corrodes it down it just beats it up it's not very good on the system and that's why it's only a 20-year life after 20 years they said that thing is going to be falling apart and they're not going to try to rehab it anymore. Um, in light of current regulation, both federal and provincial, reduction of greenhouse gas is about 30,000 tons a year. That's a, that's a phenomenal number. That represents a quarter of all greenhouse gas, give or take, a quarter of all greenhouse gas emissions from the city of Regina right there. So that alone is reason enough to do this project. That doesn't include the offsets SAS Power has from coal production. So take that and probably add another few tens of thousands of, of tons, and we may be looking at an offset of upwards of 50,000 tons. So I know that was a bit of a technical overrun of our engine. Um, I'd be happy later to talk about more about the engine, but also don't, don't stick to just the technical aspects of it. If you want to know how we got into agreements with SAS Power and all that stuff, feel free to come chat with me, and uh, I'd be more than happy to help you out. Thanks everyone for attending. Uh, my name is Sean Shackley. I'm the mayor of the village of Fox Valley. And I'd like to thank Suma for the opportunity of uh, inviting me to speak on behalf of the Southwest Incinerator Group um, with what our project is all about and, and where we're at to date. Um, we'll start kind of with the history of the committee. Um, currently we sit with 38 urban and rural municipalities entered into a pilot project. Um, we'll get to that part later, but um, with the Ministry of Environment to look at a way to cut down our solid waste issue we have in Fox Valley and in the entire southwest part of the province. Um, we have two board of uh, two executives on the board, uh, one urban, one rural, 
Um, I'm the urban representative representative on that board, and John Wagner is the uh, rural representative. Um, the board was formed five years ago with approximately 20 municipalities. Since then, um, interest in, into this project has grown drastically um, by the week, by the day. We have people phoning us and asking what we're up to and, and where we're at with it. And, and right now, sadly, we are still in the, in the testing and development process of, of this project. Um, the fellow that found this uh, incinerator was uh, Morgan Powell from Abbey. Um, I don't know if anyone knows him, but he, uh, he was big into the incineration right from the get-go. That was his, his vision. And uh, we had talked and met years prior about forming a regional landfill in our area. And um, when we realized that wasn't going to take off, Morgan stepped up with this idea. So I do really truthfully appreciate Morgan's effort. The incinerator he found was in Albany, Georgia, and it's manufactured by Eco Concepts. So the, the model that we have currently in Fox Valley is the Eco 3000F model. So this model price is about $46,350 Canadian. It's 12 feet by 10 feet wide, and it does weigh quite a bit. It's 14,500 pounds. Uh, we found that out when we were unloading it off the trailer coming up from the States, because it needed a picker. Um, the chamber to open the incinerator is seven feet by four feet, and it holds in the burn chamber about 4.1 uh, cubic yards of burn volume. So it, it'll burn um, approximately 300 pounds of garbage per hour. Um, it runs off either propane, diesel fuel, or natural gas. Currently, we have ours running off propane, um, and it's powered by just a 5,000 watt generator. Um, the primary burner, so the, your bottom burner, will burn at 704 degrees Celsius, so about 1,300 degrees Fahrenheit. And the top afterburner will burn at 982 degrees Celsius and approximately 19 or 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. Eco Concepts have had this incinerator out um, in service for about 10 years, and they've never had to replace the internal material to this incinerator yet. Um, I guess, too, just a little bit of background on Eco. They, built these and they have a manufacturer or sorry distributor in Manitoba. They started building this for BSE to incinerate cattle. So this is how they got uh, around the, the carcass and they, they incinerated the cattle and they started distributing water Manitoba. Um, that's how Morgan found it because there was actually information in Canada on it. So that's kind of how we got to where we are with them now. So in, in May of 2017, the Southwest Incinerator Committee sorry, um, started some emission testing with a test lab down in Georgia. The initial air quality test failed Canadian regulations, and the manufacturer determined it was because the garbage was burning too fast through the system. Um, the manufacturer redesigned the second stage by lengthening it and reloading the stack in order to slow down the smoke through the afterburner. So the way I've been understanding it, the afterburner is where we need to get that heat so we can burn off anything that we have coming. So dioxin, furons, so on and so forth. We want to torch them basically before they go out into the atmosphere. So with a shared cost between the Southwest Incinerator Project Group and the manufacturer, the incinerator was tested again. And this time we thought, sorry, that's what we thought, we passed two out of three times. But after meeting with Ash Olson, who's the executive director of the ministry, and I invited him to come here if there's any questions on their behalf with us, uh, and gave us the great news that we were actually testing on old standards. So we didn't pass. <laughs> but that never discouraged us because we're going to get there. To date, the incinerator committee has spent $75,000 on testing, which is all municipal money, which government, provincial government money has not been asked for or given. After the second test, 
and missing a target out of one of three burns, we needed to, to do something different. So that was once again off the old standard. So that sorry wasn't uh, wasn't applicable. But after having that discussion and finding out where we actually needed to be, because they switched them, and and for some reason we we didn't have the right information, the incinerator group decided that we needed to meet with the ministry, and we needed to get this um, incinerator into Canada so that we had our hands on it and our ability to test it and actually operate it and, and see what the unit was doing. So um, John and myself and our local MLA met with the Minister of Environment to propose the Southwest Incinerator um, Committee pilot project. Um, I work in the oil and gas business or did work in the oil and gas business. Um, and uh, we used to get summer students come out all the time and it baffled me why we were always asking them to build a rocket for NASA when we really just need an incinerator or something that had no solid waste. So when I posed that question to the minister, he looked at me that, that that's a good point. But it's something that I encourage everybody that comes to these presentations to think of. We don't really need just to focus on one of how many ideas because I think everybody's idea will work greatly together to get the one. So. I, I don't uh, I don't think that we just eliminate and stop thinking. So when we asked engineering um, students from possibly the University of Regina or University of Saskatchewan to be made available and have that as their project for the province, that was something that we're still working on and, and possibly hoping going to get to one day if we need to make engineering changes with this. Um, like I said, I thought it was very important for the incinerator to be on site because as the town of Winyard, Fox Alley has a, um, a private uh, recycling program. It was actually the old Rebel Stoke building that was turned into uh, uh, recycling. Uh, the guy bought two old bailers from Zeller's closing out in Medicine Hat, and he brought them to Fox Alley and started a uh, recycling program. So um, it's self, um, self volunteered. So, I mean, we did find once we, uh, we did an initial test burn that we still have a lot of tin cans in our garbage, but um, hopefully after some, uh, some mail outs that we, we get that recycling up because this incinerator wasn't designed to just take everything. We still think it's important to recycle and we want to run a recycling program as well. So the minister and the MLA and the committee agreed to have this pilot project go ahead. So the incinerator arrived on December 6th, and it's located at the landfill at the village of Fox Valley. To the date, the incinerator has approximately 15 burns, probably even less than that, eight, 10 burns. And um, that was basically setting the operation of the unit. When the unit was shipped, um, Thermocoupler stuff like that had to be repositioned just for for uh, transportation on the truck. So we had a little bit of issues of getting um, temperatures right and things like that. So once we we started burning and understanding what that was, we were able to get that back up. Um, like I said, we're currently running an up to a five thousand watt generator, so it's it's pretty simple that way. And I guess the reasons why we went or have had these conversations as a group is we believe it's cost effective rather than hauling our garbage. For us to go to a regional, we'd have to either go two hours to Swift Current or an hour and a half to Kindersley across the South Saskatchewan River or into Alberta. So we don't really have the luxury of an opportunity to have a close um, regional site. That being because the availability of land. Um, land as people know in the agriculture business is very hard to obtain right now and a lot of people don't want to give it away unless they get paid real well and that's fair that's their product but uh, that was was a problem for us in our area as well as rural municipalities weren't really keen on having regional landfills out in in their in their municipalities um, we believe by having an incinerator we can uh, extend the life of our landfill, this um, lowering the cost of decommissioning and cleaning up. 
protecting highway infrastructure by not hauling solid waste down the highways, not having future generations dealing with buried waste. We found since we've done more research that Europe is starting to dig up lots of their old regional landfills or landfills that be single landfills just because of what um, Mayor Rennie said. They, uh, they have lots of leakage and or, uh, seepage from old landfills that are, are leaking and they're starting to contaminate water sources. So they're digging them up and incinerating that garbage. Going forward, we think it's crucial and it is crucial to work with the ministry um, because I, I do believe we're probably one of the very first groups to come forward as, as a sole solution of waste by having incineration. Um, we need to do future emissions testing. So right now we're, we're at a standstill. The testing won't work in minus 38. So unfortunately we're probably gonna be only testing first in, in April, May when weather warms up. That gives us a realistic shot at, um, of having accurate data. Because right now the biggest thing holding this unit back from being permitted, well, the only thing is scientific data that we actually meet the emissions. So we need to do that. And we also want to make sure that it's cost effective for small urban and rural municipalities. So we, we want to do a feasibility study on it ourselves to see how much it's going to cost per burn and what that calculates in with your initial cost of your incinerator and so on and so forth. So we want to do our due diligence that way as well. But at the end of the day, our hope is for a permanent permit, a permanent permit to incinerate solid waste. And thank you for attending. Thanks. Any questions? Anybody have any questions? Lick up. Do we have time for some questions? Lick. This is Joan Corneal with the town of Gravelberg. I have a couple of questions, and the first one is for Mayor Rennie. Um, I, I'm assuming that Nipawan owns the current landfill site now. Actually, no, it doesn't. Oh, okay. Um, the six partners purchased the landfill site, um, so that was one of the very large beginning costs. It was about a million and a half dollars, and so um, we're paying that off over the next three now years, and uh, then we'll be operating on our own land. So was it Nippon's landfill? It you was the three partners, Nippon, Cadet, and the RM of Nippon. They did own okay. that piece of land. Okay. And my next question is for Greg. Um, is there any new technology out that makes it viable for small communities to get into uh, methane gas recovery and burning? So, the collection of it is is highly dependent on the size of the landfill that is currently there. So it's, it's kind of hard to say a, a, a blanket statement. Um, the collection of the, the gas can be scaled to almost any size landfill as long as it's producing methane, however. Um, some of the things that you need to look at are, again, the, ours is very big, so we can get down to the middle of it and we're not near the surface. If you get oxygen and, and just general air breakthrough, it really tends to stall the systems. So that's kind of the things you need to look at. And it, it depends on the size of the landfill and, and every landfill is different. So it's really quite hard to, to say. Um, but collection, if it's generating it, you can collect it. Can you get enough to run an engine like ours? That's questionable, but uh, you can get a, a, a flare to burn almost any amount of any gas that we need to. So just get rid of the gas then basically. Yeah, and, and okay. gas is in areas like Vancouver where it's very wet. They've got a lot worse problems with landfill gas, and it, it tends to migrate through uh, utility trenches and things like that. So that's something we're really aware of, just the hazards and the dangers of landfill gas if we don't control it in a way that is effective. Any other questions? Uh, Carol White, CAO for the town of Assiniboia. My first question is also for Mayor Rennie. You spoke of uh, trying to decide rates. What did you decide to do as far as members versus non-members, or are non-members even allowed to use your landfill? Originally, I don't know if this is on, is it? 
Originally, uh, we did allow non-members, and we used a, a, a different rate, a higher rate for allowing non-members. It didn't really work very well, so at this point, we actually are restricted to the six members, uh, unless people want to become partners, and then, of course, the, there will be a reduction. And we're still trying to find the right uh, amount of buy-in and, and all of that, and that, that's a work in progress, I think. Uh, my next question is actually for uh, CAO Winard. You mentioned your partnership with Sarcan. Um, now, did they, was that a purchase? Like they partnered with you in the purchase, or did you purchase it all and you rent it to them, or is it free rent because they're providing a service? So they provide rent. Uh, and, and part of the, when I say we partnered with them, um, they were heavily designed uh, in the, uh, are heavily involved in the design of uh, of the recycle center. Uh, they pay. I'm not going to say uh, a huge amount, but it's I don't know. They pay twenty twenty seven thousand dollars a year in rent. You know, like it's not. I don't think that's going to cover the capital cost of the building over fifteen years. But <laughs> it's you know it's it's something. It's yes. better than the. $300 a month that they paid us for the previous uh, building. But mind you, we only paid 17000 for that building back in two, whatever year we bought it in. It's all relative. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they do pay property taxes on their portion of the, uh, of the building. And uh, they just take a lot of stuff away from our landfill. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Day. Uh, Aaron Keenly, Councillor from the City of Yorkton. So just something was triggered, a thought really quickly when uh, Mayor Harper mentioned Sharps Disposal, and it might even be something that I'm looking for from uh, Greg, but we've just had a recent situation in our city where we have needle uh, exchange programs and we have needle boxes that are kind of throughout the city. And we had an issue with a few of these boxes that are located in our downtown core with businesses not being receptive to it. So we're working on kind of a new strategy with that, but what we were wondering uh, in one of the committees that I sit in is with communities that have these boxes, was there any type of statistic-based strategy on their location uh, as far as like having them in places potentially where um, users that don't want to come out into the public drop off their needles, and then also close to maybe facilities like hospitals for people who are uh, diabetics and that type of thing. Has there been any... Uh, Anything with location, these types of boxes. For for our area, the the best we did was have a, a site at the landfill to dispose of these things. But what that meant was um, the majority of people couldn't get themselves out there to dispose mm -hmm. of their sharps containers. Um, we never did have them in our downtown area, which might have been a, a, a good option, but we never did do that. So I really can't respond on that. Yeah, and in, in our circumstance. We, we do allow it in the uh, municipal waste stream. There are requirements under our solid waste bylaw for it must be, I can't remember exactly, but enclosed in a hard or double right. contained. The big problem we're actually seeing right now is in our recycling stream, people dropping it in there because those, that's hand sorted recycling. Right. So it's, it's of, of high priority to us. I know we want to go out with something or, or make a recommendation to council on it. But we're also kind of waiting to see what comes out of the hazardous waste uh, strategy or, or program. I can't remember exactly what it's called from the province. Just to see if there's anything. I know that was one of the items that was mentioned in there. It, it was not by any the highest priority, but we, yeah. we kind of want to see what direction comes out of that as well, if there's something that we could, you know, <laughs> piggyback on or ride on with that. So we're, we're kind of on hold, but we're trying to get it out of our recycling ordinance right now. Okay. No, that's good. Our health region is working really hard at it, but kind of looking for a little bit of direction, which we're having a hard time finding uh, in regards to this one situation with location. Thank you. Very good stuff. Thank you, Councillor. I don't see anyone else going to the... Oh, Jason. Uh, I'm just curious. Uh, none of the presenters here have, have really had a chance to talk except for our, uh, our conference call that we had with Stephen from SUMA, but I'm interested in Sean some in, uh, some advice on 
Uh, like uh, I know people have been talking about incineration for years and there was always the notion that it's just way too expensive. They used to throw out, you know, a million dollars for these incinerators, but at $46,000, if, if you can get that, uh, uh, if you can get that burn cycle going properly, that seems like a pretty reasonable, um, but what are the restrictions on the, on what goes in there? Do you have to sort the garbage before you throw it in there? Like what are the costs of the propane and all that to, to, uh, to run it? So right now, um, like I said, cause we're early in, in the testing of it, we're just over a hundred dollars a burn. So, um, that's that's kind of where we're at, but lots of that was with um, with lots of those ten burns being burned twice because we weren't getting that garbage hot hot enough and it wasn't actually burning. So um, now with us being at those desired temps and that, um, unfortunately with the cold weather and us being here now, um, we haven't we haven't burned um, or got enough information off it. To see where we're at but we we can tell just by what we're seeing on our ash that we're 98 percent better than we were before um so yes we, we are hoping to bring that that cost down to say 60 bucks every time we burn a load of garbage and and we're like a village of fox i produces probably um thousand eleven hundred pounds of garbage per collection we collect twice we would do two and a half three burns um, with that incinerator, the incinerator we have right now is smaller of what he burns he or he makes. Sorry, he makes a five thousand uh, pound incinerator, and and he's looking to go bigger. Um, as for regulations, the biggest hurdle, as long as you are um, under federal or provincial code of your dioxins and furons and then things like that, you can burn whatever that incinerator is taking away. So you could burn essentially anything that, that as long as you're under that regulation, that's, that's your target. So that's what binds you by law is, is what you're emitting as a, as an atmosphere. So, um, we're still going to do s recycling, um, as a mandate in, with us in, in Fox Valley. Um, we do hope, and that's why we have high expectations for this because $46,000 is a pretty cheap investment to handle your waste on site. So we have to uh, we have to work with the manufacturer and make sure that we can get our kinks worked out. We got to work with um, the ministry so um, we have the right information and the right testing going forward. And yeah, we're hoping for permanent permit. Thank you for that. Um, as we close the session, I need to thank our sponsor again, Pinter. Thank you, thank you for your sponsorship. Um, I want to thank our presenters for for their time here and their knowledge. And now there's a little homework for each of you. If, downloaded the SUMA app, you'll see that there's a there's a place on that app for feedback. We'd love to have your feedback on what you thought of the session um, so we can make the, the, the convention better next year. So we'd love to hear that from you. Um, now it's time for a break. So the break is being sponsored by TransCanada Pipelines. Our friends at TransCanada have sponsored the break and next session will start at three o'clock. Thank you for your attendance. I got progressive. Uh, 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 I, I, I never uh, moved the microphone, so I was. Right. The, the ball of the microphone uh, was racing. Uh, <laughs>